So we have looked at calculations um, for work, but the other part of the internal energy process that could be a way that energy is transferred is through um, heat. So the next section is going to cover how heat is measured. So heat is a transfer of thermal energy. It is either absorbed or released during a so as we learned in our general chemistry courses, our course, an exothermic process happens when we have heat that is transferred from the system to the surroundings. So that means if you were touching a container that has a reaction taking place inside that is an exothermic reaction, the container would feel hot. And the reaction would give off heat to the surroundings and therefore when we look at a chemical equation the liberation of energy means that energy would be on the product side so energy is given off on the other hand if we have an endothermic process then we have if we touch the reaction vessel that it would feel cold and that heat will be coming from the surroundings into the system. If we look at an, ex at an example chemical reaction where um, that is for an endothermic process, we see that energy is not on the product side like it is for an exothermic process, but energy is on the reactant side because there has to be an input of energy for the reaction to occur. And this is just another illustration that shows what I just said. Um, if we go from um, on a reaction coordinate, if this is the system for an endothermic process, heat is given off by the system. So therefore, we lose energy as the heat is given off. And we go downward on our energy coordinate, which means that the system will then have less energy because it is given off energy as heat. On the other hand, if we talk about an exothermic pro process and look at the reaction coordinate for that, as we start off with our reactants, heat is absorbed by the system. So at the end of the reaction, the energy value is going to be higher than it was at the beginning. And so therefore, your energy will be higher if you have a net input of energy from the surroundings to the system. That's just a quick illustration for looking at how energy changes during an exothermic process or an endothermic process. So, when we look at, um, before we get into the math that shows how we describe um, heat transactions mathematically, let's take a couple of scenarios for an example. Let's consider the reaction of sodium azide. Oops. This reaction here, the reaction of sodium azide. We go from solid sodium azide and we end up with solid sodium and hydrogen gas. So in this reaction, because there is a generation of gas, there is a potential for PV work to be done. But let's see how that heat transfer could be calculated depending upon what we constrain in our system. So the first example, the constraint, is volume. If we do this reaction where the volume is constrained under constant volume conditions, which means that we let the reaction take place, but we do not let the volume increase, then what you end up having is an increase in pressure. 
So if for a constant volume process, when you have a gas generated, you end up with a pressure increase. On the other hand, if we're talking about a constant vol, I'm sorry, constant pressure process, we have a scenario where the volume increases. So if we're talking about constant pressure, which would be considered here for the atmospheric pressure, which is constant, then the change in volume that we see going from the initial state here to the final state here, we have a change in volume and we saw from our calculations of work that when we have a change in volume for a um, constant pressure process, then we have a situation where we have work done as the volume increases. So let's remember these two scenarios as we go forward to the next slide to look at how um, heat is measured under constant volume conditions and how heat is measured under constant pressure conditions. So keep those two scenarios in mind. Okay, remembering those two scenarios. Now, for the constant volume process that we talked about the, at the very beginning, work for that process. Let me get my pen to act right here. And it doesn't want to do that. Let's see what we can do. Okay, so for the first scenario, which is the constant volume process, work for that scenario is equal to negative P dV or P delta V and since we just said that the process has no change in volume or the volume is constant then dV is equal to zero so we end up with negative pressure times zero so work for this condition for this scenario is equal to zero so if we want to find out what the internal energy is for a constant volume process we know that the internal energy change is the same thing as Q plus W we just proved to ourselves that W is equal to zero. So when we have a constant volume process, then the internal energy is equal to Q. Another way of writing that is internal energy is equal to the heat measured at constant volume, which is Q sub V and this is very important anytime we measure heat transfer doing a process that is measured at constant volume then we are in essence calculating the internal energy of the system now let's look at that other scenario that we considered where there is a constant pressure process. So knowing that delta U once again is equal to Q plus W and and we know what the value of work is we can substitute the value of work which is uh oh that looks like an 
inequality symbol. Let me take that out just so you don't get confused. So Q plus work is the same thing as saying Q plus negative P external DV or negative PDV. And that's equal to delta U. So since this is a constant pressure process, if we want to calculate heat under this constant pressure process, which would be the same thing as calculating Q sub P, then we would have delta U, which is the internal energy, plus P times delta V or dV. And this is a very important equation in PCHEM because this value gives us a, another state function in thermodynamics called the enthalpy. So this enthalpy H, and we're going to change all these D's to deltas here, this one as well. So, this enthalpy value, H, is equal to delta U plus P delta V. So, seeing that these two things are equal, then that tells us that delta H, which is the enthalpy, is equal to the heat that is measured at constant pressure. So any time we have a heat measurement that takes place under the conditions of constant pressure, that measurement is equivalent to measuring the enthalpy of a system. If we're measuring the process at constant volume, it's equal to the internal energy. If we measure the process at constant pressure, it's equal to the enthalpy of the system. The measurement of enthalpy is a very important whole area um, in thermodynamics and that is the, the calculation of energy transfer during chemical reactions in the branch of chemistry we call or the branch of thermodynamics we call thermochemistry that we described earlier um, in this unit but basically enthalpy values are used to define um, heat output or heat um, transfer during chemical reactions. Very important enthalpy. So anytime we are going to set out to measure the heat transfer for a process, we always have to take some things into consideration. First of all, we need to know is it a constant pressure process? Is it a constant volume process? What is the system that we're actually concentrating on? and what are the surroundings. So just because enthalpy and heat at constant pressure are the same thing, delta H being greater than zero is the same thing as an endothermic process and delta H being less than zero is the same thing as an exothermic process. On this slide we have an example of what we call a, um, a thermodynamic equation, a thermochemical equation. And the reason that I put this equation here was to demonstrate the concept that internal energy and enthalpy are extensive properties. So they depend on the amount of substance. So anytime you um, have a specific quantity of matter that you are calculating um, heat for, then if that amount changes, then your enthalpy value is going to change. The way that we can convert enthalpy 
from being a extensive property to being an intensive property is to use the values for molar internal energy and molar enthalpy where you simply take the internal energy and divide it by the number of moles that that energy was measured for or you take the value of the enthalpy and you divide it by the number of moles that the enthalpy was measured for and you end up with a unit of joules per mole in each case so that tells you that for every mole of substance that you have it doesn't matter how much of that substance you have for every mole of that substance that tells you how much energy transfer or how much energy change you can expect to happen for every single mole.